I learned to type when I was in junior high. Now, I'm going to date myself a little bit and put a picture on the screen that explains how I learned to type. So some of you will remember those old manual typewriters that, you remember that when, when the cursor would get to the end of the line, you'd hear a little bell and you'd have to slide the cursor back. Anybody remember how to learn how to type like that? And you had to press really hard on the key in order to make the keystroke function. That's how I learned to type. Here was the problem with the manual typewriter. If you ever made a mistake, it's really hard to fix. They had those eraser wheels. Anybody raise your hand? Anybody remember eraser wheels looked like a pizza cutter? And it had a little, had a little spinner thing, kind of like an eraser on your pencil. And you could scratch it off, but it would never get really clear and it'd smudge. So I remember when we got our first electric brother typewriter. We were doing good. Now, the electric typewriter functioned really much like the manual typewriter. The keys were a little bit easier to work. The only thing that the electric typewriter could do that the manual typewriter could not was correct. We had a key on the, on the keyboard called the correction key, and I could backspace the cursor over to the errant letter, and I did a lot of those, and I would backspace over to it, and I could hit the correction key. And it would put a little white out over that letter or the word or the line, kind of like they had that little bottle of white out, looked like nail polish, and you could get it out and you could do that. But this would do it for you, and it would white out your mistakes. It wasn't until after my sophomore year in college when we got our first computer. Didn't have a lot of color on it. Didn't do a lot of functions didn't even have a hard drive. But I'll tell you what my first computer had that quickly became my favorite key on the keyboard. It had a delete key. <laughs> and I could type as fast as my fingers would move, and any time I would make a mistake, it's okay. I could hit that delete key, and here was the greatness of a delete key. It was like it never happened. It was gone. The delete key reminded me something about grace. Jesus said, and I, or God said in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, Come, let's reason together. Even though your, skins are, your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. They'll be gone. And here's the lesson that I learned. There's no delete key for sin on my own. Sins linger. And every time I would sin and commit another offense against God, they would mount up. And only the grace through Christ could bring cleansing of sin. Today, as we continue in our series through Genesis chapter 4, we're going to continue looking at what Jude calls in verse 11, the way of Cain. When we last left off Cain in the story in Genesis chapter 4, Cain had sinned against God by murdering his brother. He rose up, first degree murder, killed Abel, his brother, for no reason other than he was jealous of him. He was angry. God warned him and he sinned. When we left the story of Cain in Genesis chapter 4, the Bible finished in verse 16 by saying that Cain left the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. I want to talk today about the question, how will you be remembered? As we work through the rest of Genesis chapter 4, what I want you to see is a, an increase in technology and an increase in sin. The first thing that I want you to notice from verse 16 is the defiance of living apart from God. Did you notice in verse 16 what the text says? Cain left the presence of the Lord. 
There's an intentionality there. He did it on purpose. I don't need you anymore. I'm good. I'm going my own way. And so now Cain has left defiantly the presence of the Lord. I'm on my own. I'm going to go my own way. I don't need anything that you have to offer anymore. And then as the rest of Genesis 4 begins to unfold, we'll see the filling out of the branches of that very first tree. We'll see the increase of the awareness of sin and the consequences of sin. And we'll see what becomes the folly of the way of Cain, the rapid expansion of culture, and the rapid degeneration into sin. When Cain left the presence of the Lord in Genesis chapter 4, he left a marked man. The Bible says Cain whined about the judgment that the Lord was going to bring on him because of his sin. My punishment is too great to bear. So God put a mark of grace upon him. It was a mark. And here's what the scripture says. The Lord said, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be on him seven times as much. And the Lord placed a mark on Cain so that no one finding him would kill him. Now, we don't know what the mark of Cain was, and it really doesn't serve a lot of purpose to try to speculate. What does seem to be clear is that the mark was visible to others to prevent them from killing him, but it was also a reminder for Cain of God's grace. And every time Cain would look upon his body and see that mark, Whatever that mark was, he was reminded that God in his grace did not judge him as much as his sin deserved. A reminder of the goodness of the Lord, a mark that was put on Cain. And yet, there doesn't seem to be any repentance on the part of Cain. That would have been a good time to repent. God put a mark on you. There's a judgment of the Lord as a consequence of your sin. And surely that would have been a good moment for Cain to come back into the presence of the Lord, to repent before the Lord. I have done wrong. I have sinned against you. But Cain doesn't do that. Instead, the Bible says defiantly, Cain left the presence of the Lord. He went out settled in the land of Nod. Now, sometimes when I preach, people dwell in the land of Nod. That's not really what the word means here. The word here means wandering, by the way, because part of God's judgment on Cain was he was going to be a wanderer. And so it's not clear if Cain went to the city named Wandering or if they named the city Wandering after him who was wandering from God. But the Bible says that Cain defiantly went out from the presence of the Lord and he settled east of Eden away from the land, away from the presence of the Lord, away from everything that he had previously known. And then the Bible says Cain had relations with his wife and she conceived. Now that gives rise to an age-old Bible question. Where did Cain get his wife? And oh, we, we love to speculate upon that question. Where did Cain get his wife? Do you know, it was actually part of a movie. Some of you have seen, it's dated again, 1960, the movie Inherit the Wind. Loosely based on the trial of the century at the time, uh, the state of Tennessee against John Thomas Scopes, sometimes known as the Scopes Monkey Trial, movie loosely based on that trial, Spencer Tracy playing a character who represented Clarence Darrow. And in the movie, Darrow is trying to undermine Christianity. Now, we have an authority on Clarence Darrow here who's just recently come out with a new book on Clarence Darrow. Uh, you ought to buy that book just for the title. Uh, I'm excited about reading that. Uh, uh, here's what we learn about Darrow. Right about the same time, he's writing about his pride in his agnostic lifestyle. <laughs> 
He uses that trial as a platform. And the movie calls out, and, and there's, that, there's, a, there's a scene at this sort of pivotal point in the movie where he feels like, I got you. And he uses this question as sort of evidence of an unprovable question from the Bible, where did Cain get his wife? Now, if he just read a little further in the text... The answer isn't really that complicated. So I'm in Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. Look over just a couple of verses across the, the, the page in Genesis chapter 5, verse 4. The Bible says, Then the days of Adam, after he fathered Seth, were 800 years. And he fathered, watch this, other sons and daughters. So now, as awkward as that makes you feel, the very obvious answer to the question is Cain either married his sister or a close relative. It seems very obvious. Adam and, and Eve, or at least Adam, lived 800 years after the birth of Seth. And so he had other sons and daughters through Eve. And so undoubtedly Cain, in the matter of time, listen, they lived a long time. Adam lived over 900 years. So in the course of that time, he married someone close to him. So the Bible says that Cain knew his wife and they gave birth to a child but the key part of that section is what's obvious in his stance against God. Cain has gone away from the Lord. You know, there are people today who live away from the presence of the Lord. Some in defiance. I choose to walk away from God. I choose to walk away from my faith. Some live distant from the Lord out of ignorance because they don't know. They don't know how to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. They don't know because somebody hasn't told them. But the picture here in Cain is an arrogant, a, a defiance of living away from God's presence as though I don't need him. And we find the folly of living away from the presence of the Lord. Now, beginning in verse 17, I want you to note a second consequence of a culture following the way of Cain. So look with me, beginning in verse 17, and I want you to see the arrogance of building without God. Verse 17, the Bible says, Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. Cain built a city, and he named the city Enoch after the name of his son. Now, to Enoch was born Erod, and Erod fathered Mahujael. Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. Lamech took two wives for himself. The name of one was Adah, the name of the other was Zillah. Adah gave birth to Jabal, and he was the father of those who live in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the flute. As for Zalah, she gave birth to Tubal-Cain, the forger of instruments of bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal-Cain was Naama. Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zalah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Pay attention to my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech, 77 times. We find here in the latter part of chapter 4, the world's first industrial revolution. Culture begins to expand. Cities begin to be built. Technology begins to be developed. And occupations begin to flourish. Not only do you see a city being built, but you begin to see occupations of people. Nothing wrong with these mentioned as occupations. These are simply things that people use to provide for themselves. So you see one who is a worker of the ground and a tender of animals. You see another who is gifted in music, much like some that we've seen already in our service. You see another who is a forger of metals and you see the industriousness of, of mankind building things and no doubt weaponry beginning to be developed. 
And the interesting thing about all of this expansion is what's not said. Because the problem is not with technology. The problem is not with an advancing culture. The problem is not with industry. The problem is not with business. The problem is not with any kind of, of, of wealth that they gain from that. The problem in the story is what's missing. The problem is they were building without God. It's highlighted by the man who gets the most time in the story, whose name is Lamech. Do you see the story of Lamech here? He is a shockingly unimpressive man who is very proud of himself. Four things that you notice about Lamech. I want you to see in the process of building without God, we find Lamech who, first of all, is the world's first polygamist. He has two wives, A and Z, Ada and Zalah, who, by the way, seems to have misunderstood the very simple math of God's plan for husbands and wives. It's not hard to figure out what God's plan was. One man, one woman for life. That's God's plan. It's been God's plan. In Matthew chapter 19, the, uh, the, the religious leaders were testing Jesus and they brought up the question of a man marrying again. And Jesus said, from the beginning, it was not so. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be cleaved to his wife, and the two become one flesh. It wasn't very long in the consequence of the text when we meet another man who didn't follow God's plan for marriage. His name was Abraham, who married one wife too many. And from the offspring of those two wives had children who to this day in the Middle East are feuding, and we find the consequences of not doing family God's way. He was a polygamist. The, other, the next thing that we learn, learn about Lamech is he was a murderer. I have killed a man. Now, I want you to note in the text how he explains or attempts to justify his taking of life. I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. Now, the reason for his murder is very small. The evidence is very flimsy. I've killed a man for wounding me, even a boy for striking me, kind of like somebody looked at me wrong on the street or they cut me off on the highway, so I killed them. I mean, that's really the level of what the text is saying here. I've killed a man for wounding me, a boy for striking me. I feel justified. He is not only a polygamist, he is a murderer, but we learn something else. He's thirdly arrogant. Did you see that in his self-exaltation? Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zalah. By the way, apparently Lamech begins family members by family meetings by awkwardly referring to himself in third person. Ada and Zalah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Apparently the world's first caveman, not, not, not sure about that. But he, he awkwardly refers to himself in third person as though it, it, it makes him sound better. Ada and Zalah, hear me, wives of Lamech. I've killed a man. And when you read it in its context, you can hear the tone of what he's saying. He's proud of it. Now, painting himself as the king of the hill. I'm even better than Cain. I'm better than all of those who come against me and just let another young man strike me and I'll kill him. The arrogance presuming over himself of all the pride of his accomplishments. Hear me, wives of Lamech, I'm great. He's a polygamist. He's a murderer. He was arrogant. But I want you to note, fourthly, he was blasphemous. This one's worst of all. Hear me, wives of Lamech, have killed a man for wounding me, a young boy for striking me, and if Cain is avenged sevenfold, 
then surely Lamech is avenged 77-fold. Now, what's he talking about? Well, you remember when Cain killed his brother and pled, whined, my punishment's too great, and God, in his grace, put a mark on Cain and said, I'll avenge you if anyone comes to attack you. So now, arrogantly, Lamech, now, whether he is mimicking or mocking God, somehow invoking the authority of God to pronounce vengeance for himself. But it's even more than that. Because, remember, he's arrogant, and he thinks he's better than than Cain. In fact, not just better, I'm 11 times better. And if Cain is avenged seven times, then I'll be avenged 77 times. Probably referencing infinitely more because I'm infinitely better. But you remember, God said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay and Lamech has taken upon himself the authority to, de- to pronounce a divine curse 77-fold. You remember that Jesus in the New Testament turned that around. He didn't pronounce vengeance 77 times. He pronounced forgiveness 70 times 7. Lamech representing those who are building but building without God. So in the end... You have a city with no respect for the law. You have a culture that doesn't honor life. You have a civilization that doesn't respect the Lord. Stop me if some of this begins to sound familiar. A city that doesn't respect the law of God, that doesn't honor God's plan for life, for family, for marriage. A culture that doesn't honor life that God created and a civilization that doesn't even acknowledge the Lord. And in all of their great advancements, they have not learned the key to how to conquer sin. And the result was a culture moving away from the Lord. What was produced was first a wealth that did not satisfy. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, what would it gain a man if he gained the whole world, but he forfeited his soul? How good is that? How great is that transition? If you get everything, but you lose your soul. And you have a soulless culture who is accumulating things for themselves, but they're doing it without God. Wealth that did not satisfy, progress that did not last. Think about this. Everything that Cain's family produced was destroyed in the flood. All kinds of people have all kinds of speculation about how advanced Cain's culture was, and different people have all kinds of theories about how great that culture must have been. But whatever was done in that culture was destroyed just a few years later when God destroyed all of that with the flood. Psalmist said in Psalm 127, verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm chapter 37. I want you to hear the psalmist describing a culture of evil. Psalm 37, beginning in verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Live in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. He will bring out your righteousness as light, your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Don't get upset because the one who is successful in his way. Because of the person who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and abandon wrath. Don't get upset. It leads only to evil doing. Evil doers will be eliminated. But those who wait for the Lord will inherit the land. The way of Cain. They were an advancing culture. 
but they had not found the solution for sin. The defiant living apart from God, the arrogant building without God, contrasted at the very end of the chapter with two short verses. All of the progress that's displayed in chapter 4 is contrasted in the last two verses of the chapter. Look with me in Genesis 4, verse 25 and 26. Adam had relations with his wife again. She gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For She said, God has appointed me another child in the place of Abel because Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born and he named him Enosh. Then people began to call on the name of the Lord. There's a contrast being explained here between the way of Cain and the way of Seth. The way of evil and the way of good. The way of the evil one and the way of the Lord. We see contrasted here the arrogance of those who would build and give God no credit, the defiance of those who would go their own way and leave behind all that God has. But there came a day, Adam knew his wife again, and she gave birth to a son, and she named him Seth. God has appointed for me an offspring. His name means appointed one. God has appointed for me another. Then people began to call on the name of the Lord. And now you begin to see the outgrowth of what happens, the significance of building on God, the impact of those who would live their lives by faith, the impact of those who would base their decisions on the truthfulness of God's word, how a culture was changed, how the world was changed by a man. Adam had relations with his wife again. She gave birth to a son and she named him Seth. God's appointed for me another child in the place of Abel because Cain killed him. They hadn't forgotten. And all of a sudden, however long this was from that occasion, Adam and Eve have recognized the impact of the way of Cain. The Bible says that Adam lived 800 years after the birth of Seth. Now, he died at 930, which means he was 130 years old when Seth was born. So between the time when Cain killed Abel and Eve gave birth to Seth, many of the events that we just read in chapter 4 begin to take place. And Adam and Eve saw it. They witnessed the degeneration of their culture. They witnessed their family going away from the Lord. They witnessed civilization advancing, but doing so apart from God. And then God gave them Seth doesn't mean that they hadn't had any children prior to that or between Abel and Seth. It just means in that moment, they knew something about this child is an appointment from God. God has appointed a child. And then the Bible says, men began to call on the name of the Lord. Something about the impact of this child changed the world. He foreshadows Christ in at least two ways. He is the offspring. Remember back in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 when that curse over the enemy was initially portrayed, the picture of the gospel, you'll bruise him on the heel, but he will crush you on the head, the offspring of the woman. Eve says, I've given birth to another seed. Seth also foreshadows Christ in the fact that he is in the place of another. 
Look what the text says. She gave birth to a son. She named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another child in the place of Abel. And all the good that God would have done through Abel, God now accomplishes through Seth. Seth now in the place of another. Seth now in the place of those who had already gone. And now all of a sudden, Seth's line begins to pioneer corporate worship. Because then, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Somehow, through a godly influence that perhaps began from the remnant of the memory of Abel through the line of Seth to his son Enosh, then men began to call on the name of the Lord. All of a sudden, the compounding interest of a godly offspring begins to take root, and now there's a family of faith who are calling on the name of the Lord. They sought the Lord. They're calling out to the Lord in prayer. That's the impact of that language They're calling on him. And all of a sudden, a sense of revival begins to take place as now there's a family that stands in opposition to the evil in their culture. Now there's a people who seek God rather than seeking simply the things about themselves. All of a sudden now, there's somebody who calls on the name of the Lord. They sought the Lord. Note Luke chapter 3. Luke traces the genealogy of Christ through the line of Seth. And from him came a line that led to the impact of a Messiah. They sought the Lord. They honored his name. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. You'll note in your English translation, all four letters of Lord are capitalized, indicating that this is the covenant name of the Lord. It is the name God has adopted for himself, the name by which he identified himself to Moses, the name by which he proclaimed to the people of Israel, I am Yahweh, that's my name. The name that he says, do not dishonor my name. Then... Men began to call on the name of the Lord. Contrast verse 17 with verse 26. And I want you to note the repetition of two things. Calling and naming. Cain had relations with his wife. She conceived, gave birth to Enoch. Cain built a city and he called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. And the same two Hebrew words in verse 17 occur again in verse 26. The calling and the naming. And then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Two families, two legacies. What do I do when my culture is moving away from God? How do I stand in the midst of that? How do I live my faith in a culture that seems to be defiant, that arrogantly returns or turns away from God's word? And all of a sudden, we are reminded that God in his providence can take one man. And through a man of faith, a family that turns back to God, God can change the world. You have an appointment with God. You have a Seth. You have an appointment. You have a plan that God has for your life that only you can accomplish. God has a divine appointment for you. The advancements of civilization are impressive and they are not necessarily evil. But the Bible reminds us of the folly of advancement without faithfulness. You have an appointment. And in the face of a culture 
that seems to be drifting further and further away from God, God is calling on you to stand. God is calling on your family to live your faith in the midst of a culture that denies it. God is calling on you to boldly proclaim the name of the Lord. You have an appointment. And like Seth's family, you only find God's purpose by seeking his name. As you leverage your influence for the cause of Christ, as you begin to live your faith to impact a world around you, listen, I'm proud of my name and the heritage of my family's name, but vastly more than that is the honor of God's name. And you and I, to make an impact on our culture, must choose to seek God's name. No matter the depths of the darkness around us, God's plan will not be thwarted. There's sin, but God will overcome. There is darkness, but God will overcome. There's perversion and wickedness and evil all around us. But the Bible tells us that God in his sovereign grace will overcome. His purpose will be accomplished. His plans will not fail. You have a chance today to be a part of that. About 100 years ago, there was a study done on the impact of two people. One was a man named Max Jukes. Max Jukes was a career criminal in the 1700s. Spent the latter parts of his life in prison, in and out of prison most of his life, and his offspring resembling the sinfulness of Max Jukes. Around that same time, there was a preacher named Jonathan Edwards. And one day... An educator sat down to compare two families. And over the course of about a century, here's what he discovered. In the line of Jonathan Edwards and the line of Max Jukes. In Max Jukes' line, there were seven murderers, 60 thieves, 190 prostitutes, 150 convicts, 310 paupers, and 440 alcoholics in 100 years. In that same period of time, in Jonathan Edwards' legacy, there was one U.S. vice president, one dean of a law school, one dean of a medical school, three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 60 doctors, 65 professors, 75 military officers, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, 100 clergymen, and 285 college graduates. I want to ask you this morning, how will you be remembered? You have the choice today of following the line of Cain or following the way of Seth. Seth.